Hello, uh, this is Dan Lapel for New Focus Recordings. Uh, very excited to be joined by David Liptak from Rochester uh, to talk about an album coming out this Friday, Brightening Air. Good morning, David. How's it going? Good morning, Dan. How are you? I'm it's good. Just, yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for, for making time to, to talk about this album. Uh, really happy to be working with you again. We did uh, your dub songs a couple years ago, uh, which was for sort of smaller forces, much more intimate uh, album. And, and now this album focuses on wind ensemble music. Yes. Um, I, yeah, the, the other album was more varied, um, different kinds of ensembles and performers that I've had the pleasure to work with over the years. Uh, this this piece is actually focused in on wind ensemble music and of the five pieces on the album, four of them are written for the Eastman Wind Ensemble. Um, I've been teaching at Eastman for oh, almost 35 years now, so I've been here a long time. Um, the, um, in addition, the three of those pieces written for the Eastman Wind Ensemble is, were written for my uh, collaborator in this album, the conductor Mark Scatterday, who's been, uh, um, who's been really an important uh, partner uh, over the years, uh, getting me involved in writing for the Wind Ensemble and making, making it possible for me to do so. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to speak about that. Yeah, uh, well, it's also a pleasure for me to hear uh, your work sort of manifest in, in this different context and sort of the uh, additional coloristic and orchestrational things that, that come up uh, in a larger uh, ensemble context. So it's great. Well, should, should we jump in and, and sort of introduce uh, the, the first piece, Fulgore's Months, which features Tony Arnold? Yeah, happy to. Uh, Fedora's Months uh, was the uh, second piece I wrote for Mark Scatterday. Um, actually, it was uh, commissioned from a consortium of wind ensembles that I think there were 12 of them or so, who all put together, you know, the plan to uh, to uh, commission a piece and then and do a performance. And I was happy about that. Um, I had I had just at that time started working with Tony. Uh, we have at the Eastman School a regular yearly residency for someone who who can, who is um, is it usually a composer who appears at Eastman and stays for um, two or three weeks, or in some cases spread out in different visits throughout the semester. And Tony was um, one of our guests, and um, she was living in Buffalo then, so it wasn't you know it wasn't a big trek to get back and forth. And I wrote this piece in connection with her visit. And that was the first time we worked together. Um, no, second time, actually. I also, uh, I've forgotten that I'd also, um, she was here to do some of Maria Davidowski's music in performance at the Eastman School, and I was, uh, I was conducting the ensemble. But this was the first time I had written for her. Um, Mark wanted a piece for uh, a wind ensemble to make the consortium commission work I recommended that we do a set of songs because I really wanted to write for Tony, but I also am interested in songwriting in general. And that's how this piece came to be. Uh, the poetry is from a 14th century uh, Italian nobleman, uh, also um, a poet, but um, basically someone from the noble cat, uh, class. And uh, I, I was made aware of this by my friend John Thau who was a composer who uh, was living in California, who sent me a Christmas greeting with its own translation of one of these poems into, the, into modern day English. And so remembering that, I, I, I discovered all of the ones in this particular collection uh, uh, of uh, one for each month, 12 months, and chose four for the, for the uh, setting. Great, great. Uh, well, maybe let's uh, let's listen to the opening of the first uh, month, February, uh, and you can uh, sort of speak about it a bit after after we've heard it. 
So this is uh, February from Folgore's Months, Tony Arnold Soprano with the Eastman Wind Ensemble, Mark Scatterday conducting. Would you like to say a, a little bit about uh, that excerpt or, or the text that we heard? Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be pleased to. Uh, these poems, every one of them were written to, um, to be uh, recited at a gathering of noblemen, young noblemen in Italy who would uh, have these uh, um, events. They, they were big parties and it was, it was a lot of rabble rousing and it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. And the poem that you just heard for the first song is from the month February. And um, if it, it's really about hunting more than anything else. It's about a hunting, uh, and if, if I may read just a bit about, read a, read a bit about the text at the beginning, maybe three or four lines. Uh, this is a translation by uh, uh, Rossetti from the 19th century. February. In February I give you gallant sport of hearts and hinds and great wild boars and all your company, good foresters and tall, with buskins drawn and jerkins close and short, and your leashes hounds a brave report. And um, so it goes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a hunting uh, poem. And it's everyday fun life in yeah. 14th century Italy. <laughs> and the, the, uh, <clears throat> The vigor of of that kind of activity is definitely reflected in the in the the writing. It's great. No, uh, you. Yeah. So uh, that's the only work on the the recording that features voice and text. Uh, should we talk a little bit about uh, "Through the Brightening Air," the in, sort of the title track, uh, and yeah. also a piece uh, that is dedicated to uh, a longtime colleague of yours uh, who had a lot of influence on, well, the whole contemporary music world, but certainly also the, the upstate New York uh, community. Yeah, uh, Stephen Stuckey and I became friends um, because we were both teaching in schools in Western New York. He was at Cornell for many years and I'd been teaching at Eastman. And we actually, um, didn't know each other when we were younger, so we became friends in middle age, which is um, which is interesting, and um, it it, uh, it it the exchange of the two schools helped foster that. But I, it was carried over into other parts of our lives. We visited each other in Europe once, and you know spent some time together. Um, but um, he was a, he was a remarkable friend, and I think he was a friend to everyone. I think the thing about Stephen, which was really interesting to me, was. Um, he could make anyone feel as if he was speaking directly to you and nobody else. And I've seen him do that. And for that reason, he was an important guide, mentor, and um, advisor for all sorts of uh, musical things. Um, and his, uh, his death at age 66 was, uh, was quite a loss to many of us. Mark Scatterday, uh, was before he came to Eastman on the faculty of Cornell University, and he he was also you know a close friend of Stevens. Uh, so when I suggested to Mark that I wanted to make a piece, which was a, a memory piece for Stephen, he was uh, he was um, really connected to that, and he um, you know he supported it. And through the brightening air is indeed that uh, it um, it's taken the title is taken from a poem. Uh, by Yeats, 
the son of wandering Angus. And it, uh, the story is that Angus had uh, in his hut, and Angus is an older person, uh, had went fishing and he caught a silver fish uh, and took it back to his hut to cook. And uh, in the poem, uh, he began cooking, uh, putting the water on, and then he turned around and saw that the fish had turned into a glimmering girl. And uh, as she saw him, she called out his name and left uh, wandering, running into the brightening air. Uh, it's a beautiful poem, and it seemed to me to be, uh, you know, there's something about that which I felt Stephen would have liked a lot, so I included it as sort of the subtext for this piece. Great. Well, let's listen to uh, the opening of Through the Brightening Air. Great. Uh, I, I should mention, actually, uh, sort of as a test of testimony to what you were saying about Stephen's influence. Uh, we have a handful of albums where, in some context or another, uh, uh, homage to his uh, relationships with musicians has come up. In fact, there was one release, a uh, violin and piano release, uh, Nicholas Di Eugenio violinist released Into the Silence, which has uh, a, a beautiful piece of Stevens along with several of his students. Uh, so it's it's great to see uh, sort of the his legacy popping up on all these different recordings and, and projects and uh, wonderful to have one more of those. Um, yeah. So uh, let's let's now turn to uh, the octet. Uh, which is written for uh, the same instrumentation as Stravinsky's famous octet uh, and sort of, uh, I guess in a way, sort of zooms in uh, to a, you know, a wonder-part uh, type of in instrumentation and gives us a slightly different uh, leaner texture on the album. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of trajectory of this piece? Yeah, it was. Uh, this was the um, it was the first piece that I'd written for March Saturday in the ensemble, and he wanted the piece to be paired with the Stravinsky Octet on a concert, and um, so I I took a deep breath and decided that I would try to do that. Um, I, I it was written in two thousand five. The version that's 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 that survived is a slightly smaller one than the original, and uh, I made that a few years later. Um, um, in each movement, I tried to write um, music which was not Stravinsky, but yet that's impossible because of the extremely you know, unusual instrumentation. It's, all, it's really difficult, so it has a tension to it in a way in my mind. You know, I'm always trying to write my music, but on the other hand, I'm being drawn back into the sound of the Stravinsky octet, as, even as I am doing so. And in uh, the movement I, uh, you're going to hear, I, the third movement, uh, there are you know things which are very, I think, particular about that. I'm not sure that will be in the first minute, but for example, there are scale passages in the bassoon, which is which are taken, uh, which remind me very much of the kind of scalar passages for those same instruments in the octet in different places. Uh, I wanted to write a piece that was clean, that was. Uh, that was, you know, very lean and, and uh, athletic and muscular. 
Uh, sometimes uh, the move, moon, the piece is not flat. Sometimes there are slower things that happen. Uh, but uh, that was that was my that was my idea about how to make this piece. Yeah, I, I think it. I mean, the extent to which it's really uh, almost impossible to avoid the dialogue with uh, Stravinsky. But I, I, in listening to it, I actually enjoyed that back and forth that you cultivated uh, sort of engaging with Stravinsky-esque material, so to speak, and and then bringing other types of uh, sounds into it. So let's let's listen to a bit of uh, the third movement, Fantasia, from the octet. Wonderful. So, well, to close out our discussion, maybe we can uh, revisit the earliest piece on this album, uh, Soundings, which is the one piece that was not originally written for the Eastman Wind Ensemble, correct? Yeah, that's correct. That one was written in 1982, uh, which, uh, and it seems like such a long time to me, talking about it is uh, like talking about someone else doing something else. <laughs> Although I think the music was very much sort of of a piece of the things that I'm interested in writing now. I, th I think it's all connected. I was asked to write in 1982 um, a piece for the opening of the Wharton Center for the Performing Arts, which is uh, the, um, uh, located at, uh, in, it's on the campus of Michigan State University, where I was, that was my first job teaching. So I was asked to write this piece. Um, um, I wanted to write for Wind Ensemble. Uh, I was asked to do so, but I wanted to write for Wind Ensemble because I had, um, I had, um, in earlier days, you know, spent a lot of my time listening to this kind of ensemble and being really captivated by it, and have not re had not really done that. This um, the idea of a wind ensemble, which is in its in, in, in enlarged. Uh, orchestral wooden section rather than a symphonic band which has multiples of instruments like clarinets. So I wrote uh, the piece with uh, this ambition in mind. Uh, it is probably the largest piece in terms of sound and in terms of the kinds of textures that is on the recording. Um, there are, um, uh, uh, it's the largest instrumentation I believe and it uses saxophones um, and other instruments which are not found in the other pieces that I had written uh, so much. Uh, I wrote it for performance uh, that on the concert which opened the Wharton Center, uh, which, uh, which took place. Uh, and um, uh, I guess that's it. uh, what I, it's uh, the piece is called Soundings, actually. Uh, in my mind, when I used that title, I was thinking of the, something very, uh, you know, um, not very explicit, just the fact that all of these instruments are sounding together. But I was also imagining how this ensemble has uh, a depth to it, which I was trying to explore. And I was thinking about soundings in relation to the kinds of uh, ways one measures um, the uh, depth of water, uh, taking soundings to uh, find, find out about that kind of thing. And in a way, in my own um, in my own um, analogy of what I was doing, I was thinking about deeping, uh, dipping into the deep recesses of the of the ensemble and seeing what I could find. 
Very interesting. And I think I may have uh, spoken in error before when I said the octet is the one piece uh, on the recording that would be one to a part because this this piece also is one to a part. It's just a much larger instrumentation. Many, so, many more parts, yes. Yeah, yeah. So really the distinguishing feature for the octet is just the, the, the smaller size of the, the orchestration. Um, great. Well, let's listen to the first uh, minute or so of soundings uh, from from 1982. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, this was such a nice uh, chance to sample some of the stuff on this great album. Uh, before we close out uh, this this chat, I just want to throw out uh, the names of the wonderful people behind the scenes who were involved uh, in this production uh, effort with you. Uh, Mark Scatterday also produced with you uh, and uh, co-produced by Kevin Holtzman uh recording engineer and post-production and mastering was all done by john trubger uh eastman school of music uh provided the locations for all the recordings um and uh mark wolf did uh the design and layout and the wonderful uh cover photography was by kim holtermond uh and i think that looks like that's it uh anything else you'd like to add uh before we sign off well just that i'm really grateful for all of this this project was called was carried by many people um and and you know i felt like i was being you know helped along so much through the whole process but with you too dan and 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 your team at, at new focus and i appreciate that it's nice to have this album as a sort of a companion to the other because the photographer is the same for both um ah. Kim Holtemann is, is a Danish photographer who uh, we have become uh, friends over the process of just being in touch about making these two projects. Yeah, I, I, I had forgotten that or hadn't noticed uh, that that nice detail, but it is always great when there's that kind of continuity, uh, you know, between projects and over a longer period of time. Well, thanks again, David. Uh, it was great to chat with you. So uh, the album comes out this Friday. It's uh, FCR 323, David Liptak's Brightening Air with the Eastman's uh, Wind Ensemble and Mark Scatterday, Tony Arnold's Soprano. And uh, of course you can find it in all the places that our late capitalist landscape makes music available. Yeah. Uh, thanks everybody for, for tuning in and uh, see everybody soon. Take care. Bye-bye.